welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We're happy to see so many of you attending this webinar today uh, about turf management. I'm Joyce Kennedy with People and Pollinators Action Network or PPAN for short. Again, please take, if you're just entering, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. PPAN advocates for pollinator protection and conservation through education and actions that promote sustainable land management practices that safeguard human and pollinator health. And one aspect of PPAN's work is to partner with communities to enhance habitat and increase safe spaces for pollinators to thrive. We were so pleased to work with the city of Longmont in 2007 to pass a pollinator resolution, recognizing the importance of protecting and supporting pollinators. This work led to discussions with the city about next steps to promote pollinator health. Since reducing pesticide use in public parks is one way to create safe spaces for people and pollinators, the city launched two organic turf pilots. Municipal pilots provide a tangible way to trial organic turf management. PPAN, along with our partners, Beyond Pesticides, Osborne Organics, and Natural Grocers, is so pleased to support and highlight the great work that Longmont is doing. We're particularly excited to have Ben Gratton, Longmont's park supervisor and organic turf management expert here to tell the story of the park transitions, along with technical experts, Jay Feldman, executive director of Beyond Pesticides and Chip Osborne of Osborne Organics. We also have a special guest, David Bell, Longmont's Natural Resources Manager of Public Works and Natural Resources. Again, as we're getting started, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. And throughout the event, you can post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we're going to do our best to answer as many of those questions as possible at uh, during the question and answer portion of this event. At the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see the Q&A icon. And if you don't see the button, it seems that Zoom's added a lot new, a lot of new functions. Look for the three dots and click on those uh, for more options to find that Q&A option. And to launch us, I'd like to welcome Alan Williams, Vice President of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs from Natural Grocers. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, Joyce. This is actually Alan Lewis, but we'll bring Williams on later. <laughs> I'm here just really briefly to, to call out uh, Joyce and uh, from PPAN and Jay from Beyond Pesticides for working for decades to put the foundation of these projects in place. Natural Grocers has been raising money for maybe five years or so. Um, and contributing directly for five years or so to make these happen, but it's the foundation that they put in place that's made that possible. The one thing I wanted to share with everyone on the call is that citizens love this. Our customers are willing to donate to do these organic park conversions and turf conversions in their communities. We're approaching three quarters of a million dollars that Natural Grocers has donated and our customers have donated a few dollars at a time because this is such a compelling proposition. So they can go barefoot with their kids and their pets and their babies in the parks and know that they're going to be safe uh, while they're enjoying those amenities. The related thing to that, I think a lot of people on the call, is that when we talk to citizens and bring local voices to the conversations with the parks department or the city parks maintenance or school district, that's the key catalyst where the local officials realize that 
There is a base of support for this far beyond what they often imagined, but it also reduces that nagging doubt about whether a misstep or something that doesn't look perfect for a few months is going to be tolerated. When there's a collaboration between the local citizens and the city or the school district, um, this goes really, really well. And we've never had a failure. I will put a link in the chat to a, a dozen of these uh, parks pilots that Natural Grocers has been involved in with beautiful pictures of established programs. So you can get an idea of the depth and breadth of how successful this is. So again, thanks for everyone who made this possible. And we are so proud and happy to be longtime deep supporters of the effort. Thank you. Thanks for your deep commitment to this program, Alan. Appreciate it. Alan Lewis. And now I'd like to welcome Jay Feldman, Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides, who will give us an overview of the parks program and uh, really talk about why organic is important. Welcome, Jay. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you to Natural Grocers and to the City of Longmont for engaging on this. Um, I'm Jay Feldman, Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides. We were founded in 1981 to really bridge the health and environmental interests of communities. And in communities, I mean people that are living in communities, teaching, working. So we're bridging the interests of the general public uh, with land managers, with farmers, with public health uh, professionals, as well as a, a range of people that are gardeners and environmentalists, et cetera. Um, we certainly, uh, what I'm gonna do here is now switch into my slides and then share with you um, a presentation that I will give context to what we're, what we're doing, why we're here and how we're proceeding with all of this. We at Beyond Pesticides, really were inspired early on by uh, Rachel Carson, who, as you may know, uh, worked for the Bureau of Fisheries, which became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and wrote this book in 1962 called Silent Spring. My two takeaways from this book, which have really helped guide me, is that we are among many organism that, organisms that live, we, us, right, that live in a complex biological system. And what Rachel Carson identified was that we were really using pesticides in a way that didn't take into consideration the impact we might have on those biological systems. We're gonna be talking about this today in more technical terms. The other thing, the other takeaway for me is that she really advocated, this was in 1962, that we adopt alternatives. And we took that to heart, of course, as we traveled the country and met with people who were using toxic chemicals and had adverse reactions, saw contamination, and we settled in on organic. Organic uh, as a tool for managing landscapes. Um, organic as, at its heart really eliminates petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers that are disruptive of human and ecosystem health. It manages soil health, we'll be talking about that, but in addition, the exciting part is it also sequesters atmospheric carbon to combat the climate crisis and nurtures biodiversity. So really when we're talking about organic land management, we're talking about the intersection of health, climate and biodiversity. Now, as you know, many of you, most of you probably know when you're handling a pesticide, you're really handling a formulation of chemicals. Yeah, we hear about glyphosate, right? But glyphosate's part of a constellation of materials that are found in a product, it may be called Roundup. And actually the active ingredient glyphosate is a small percentage of the overall formulation. The, regula the regulators really focus in on the active ingredient, right? And they look at the adverse health effects and so forth. You need to know that we're dealing with these other ingredients, which are called inert or other ingredients. They can be hazardous contaminants and impurities and metabolites. Now, as we evaluate these chemicals, we looked at the 40 most commonly used lawn pesticides and we found 26 are likely or probable carcinogens, 24 are known or suspected endocrine disruptors, 
birth defects, reproductive toxicants, kidney liver damage, and irritants or sensitizers. And when we looked at environmental impacts, we see impacts on groundwater, birds, fish, and toxicity to bees. So, you know, when you, when you look at the material, obviously, as a user, we have a target pest in mind, right? We have a weed or an insect that we want to kill, but there are a lot of indirect effects, unfortunately. Herbicides can reduce reduction of habitat for butterflies, systemic chemicals that get into the vascular system of the plant and are expressed through nectar, gutation droplets and uh, of the plant, um, you know, adversely affect indiscriminately bees that are foraging, whether they're natural bees or honeybees. And part of the problem beyond that, of course, are the health impacts on, on, on us, those who use it, those who use the, the, the areas that are treated, uh, neighbors that might be exposed to drift. And unfortunately, there are a lot of complexities in the calculation of acceptable risk that are not adequately addressed. And we could spend a whole day on this. I mean, you know, as a manager of a field that you're handling a lot of different materials and those mixtures are not considered by EPA. Very little attention to inerts and breakdown products we discussed earlier. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, there are a lot of uncertainties related to what impacts we're going to have on human health and the environment. So organic becomes our focus. We do spend a lot of time reviewing the scientific literature and looking at the impacts associated with these pesticides. But we then also spend a fair amount of time looking at how do we actually put in place the alternative. And that's what that's really why we're here today. Um, and in that change, we're talking about looking at how we're relating to nature. You know, in the ag world and increasingly in land management in parks and playing fields, we talk about ecosystem services, which means that, you know, the ecosystem obviously can cycle nutrients naturally, can do all these great things that otherwise cost money. So the soil's teeming with life. That goes back to Rachel Carson's point about complex biological communities. And when we apply these materials, we're hurting those uh, elements of life. Now, we're going to be hearing today from Chip Osborne, as well as Ben Grattan. Um, I visited Chip's field. This is a field, a field hockey. Uh, one hot summer day in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and this is what I saw, Chip's organic field. So look forward to hearing from him later. And I sat there and said, well, how, how do you do this? And we looked, you know, the first thing you hear from a manager, land manager, is that it's more than materials. It's, it's a bunch of cultural practices from aeration to mowing. And we're going to talk about that today. Um, but they're also an understanding that these different practices constitute a system, a systems approach. And a lot of these experiences are, are born out from organic agriculture, where organic is really clearly defined under an organic systems plan, compatible materials, and so forth. Um, the, the plan has to contain different elements that really go to questions of soil fertility. Um, when you look at agriculture, obviously, they're talking about tillage. We're talking about aeration. We're talking about how do we manage that system, right? The question of materials is not a question of simple substitution. We're not talking about product substitution. We're talking about the how do we use materials within that system responsibly. And that's where we rely on the national list of allowed and prohibited substances and exempt pesticides. We at Beyond Pesticides, we track these pesticides or these inputs, I should say, very carefully. We produce a list in which we identify the related materials to land management, parks, playing fields. And then we incorporate this into our program, Parks for Sustainable Future, where we, because of companies like Natural Grocers, we are able to underwrite virtually all of the costs associated with uh, bringing a plan, an evaluation of the soil, a uh, ongoing consultation to the community, which is what we did in Longmont, so that we can work with your expertise, your knowledge, your understanding of what's going on on your fields 
and apply these organic concepts. We call that parks or sustainable future. The one thing I wanted to do before I end is give you a sense of the holistic thinking that goes into this approach organic. This is actually a study, uh, a graph of these leaves, interesting graph, um, in which they evaluated chemical intensive agriculture and organic. Again, very similar concepts here. And you can see the leaves on the, on the right side is organic. And virtually in every area, soil quality, minimization of energy use, biodiversity, of course, water pollution, and not only water pollution, but water use, less water use, um, even total cost, which we can talk about as well, and e those ecosystem services. Key to our concerns uh, and our organization's concern are the impacts on workers, those handling these materials. Again, workers uh, are, are greatly benefited from this approach. So I know, you know, whenever we meet with uh, landscapers and parks departments and farmers, the first thing we hear is I practice IPM, integrated pest management, which we really got behind um, in the 80s and 90s. And then we found that it just wasn't going far enough. So now we talk about beyond IPM, right? So we're talking about how do we put together this system? How do we actually define the practices? How do we integrate compatible materials? And then how do we create sustainability that where we see greater resiliency, less water use, we see a, a, a compatible system that supports biodiversity, and we see protection of our children and our pets and our communities. Um, we are so excited about this and the partnership with Longmont and the partnership with other parks departments, because you know what? We really see the parks departments as a leading edge of solving some of the most important environmental and public health problems that we face today. It starts with the soil. We take a soil sample, and then we understand that we need to be concerned about organic matter in the soil. What does that mean? We're gonna learn about that. Soil biomass. What is the concept of feed the soil? We're putting support for the natural biological activity as opposed to soluble nutrients, synthetic that go directly to the plant and bypass nature and bypass that soil structure. Um, and, and then we're talking about natural fertilizers that are broken down by the microbi microbial life. So this is, this is exciting for us. We really believe based on our scientific research on the hazards, based on our experience with the implementation of organic and the benefits that we see for health in the environment and for workers who are managing fields, um, we see this as the only option for a livable future. And we're really happy to have you guys be a part of this today. And we look forward to working with you down the road. Thanks so much. Jay, thank you so much. Thanks for framing this out for us. Welcome, thank you. Appreciate it. And if you've joined since we've begun, I just want to uh, put a reminder out that you can use the Q&A function for all of your questions. As you think of them, please plug them in there and we'll be working to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, we're trying to leave about at least 20 minutes to answer questions. So that should make for a great discussion. Now I'd like to invent, uh, invite Ben Gratton, Longmont's Park Supervisor, Ben, and it's been such a pleasure partnering with Ben, um, and he has become such a leader in this field. So we're excited to hear from him. Welcome, Ben. Yep. Thanks for having me, Joyce. Let me share my screen with everybody. All right. Uh, are you able to see that the print on there? It looks great, Ben. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Ben. I've been working with the city of Longmont for about seven years now, and I am the horticulture uh, manager for all of Park operations uh, here with Longmont. 
So yeah, we're going to be going through a little bit about uh, what we've done here in Longmont, uh, actually out in the field, and how we were able to um, transition from conventional uh, fertilizers and, and management uh, over to this sort of organic practices. Um, so I started in the industry back in 07. Um, I've been hopping around uh, various parks and rec departments all over the front range. Um, and everywhere I went, more and more and more, I've heard about uh, people's interest in organic maintenance and pesticide free maintenance and uh, water rise uh, landscaping is now, you know, uh, coming up as well as uh, major interest uh, community wide. And so I actually had that same interest. And when I bought uh, my house here in uh, Longmont in, in 18, I actually started uh, all this organic uh, process in my own yard. And so uh, this house had been uh, done synthetically since 1999. And uh, one year, uh, next time, I just decided to take a stab at it uh, with organic maintenance, and uh, I I had such amazing results that I started talking with my uh, coworkers and managers and asking them about you know taking this proof of concept and you know pushing it up to try to test it out at a park, you know, larger acreage uh, than just my yard. So this picture here is just an uh, example. This is the yard, uh, first year in, uh, middle of July, and that looks pretty awesome. So a little background on our parts. We uh, did this uh, testing at uh, two different ones. Uh, one's uh, Roosevelt Park. It's uh, right smack in the middle of the city here uh, in our downtown area. Uh, it usually has four to six to eight, uh, depending on the year, uh, festivals and uh, large events. Uh, this is uh, now where our rhythm on the river was moved to. Uh, we have Cinco de Mayo and a bunch of other uh, really large events here every year out in that, that tenor area uh, in, the, in this middle. It's about four and a half acre uh, uh, area out in the middle. And we also have an outdoor pool, a memorial rose garden here on the west end, our senior center. Uh, uh, it's like a mini recreation center down here. And then our ice, our pavilion, uh, where we have ice rink uh, over the wintertime. So it's a, a very heavily used uh, park by our community. And then I also wanted to try an example of athletic areas. And so we chose Garden Acres, which I'm sure a lot of you in this area are familiar with. It's a very heavily used athletic uh, complex built in the 70s up in the northwest part of Longmont. And it's about 14 and a half acres uh, overall turf-wise. And uh, softball, baseball out here in the middle. And we have uh, multi-use fields on the outer edges. They get programmed uh, most of the year. And then we have a, a detention pond on the north end that also doubles as a cricket field. So in 2019, I met with Chip uh, here in Longmont and we um, started the whole process and, and went over you know, what this whole program was. Um, did an hour long uh, classroom training with him, kind of, you know, the whole science behind this thing. And uh, and we went out and visited those parks, took samples of each one. Uh, we did a soil analysis for chemistry with CSU and then um, actual biological sample and sent it off to New York. So that, that really tells you what, um, you know, living organisms are actually in that soil at that time that you took it. And then of course, uh, we all know what happened 
2020, uh, we were going to start work then, and it was kind of an up in the air time. And so we I had to push off uh, all that work till the end of the year. Uh, we weren't certain about budgets and how what we were going to be doing um, for the year, like most of us. And so that year was just a, a more planning, uh, looking at fertilizer uh, options in the area, trying to figure out, should we go liquid, custom mixes, you know, uh, what's here locally. So I worked on that with Chip all that year. And then in 21, it was really when we started the actual programs. So this has been our third uh, full year of doing it. And uh, we chose Rich Lawn uh, Fertilizer, uh, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's chicken waste uh, by product. And we, we chose that only because it was uh, easy to purchase in uh, large amounts and then easy to apply it uh, to our parks. And so uh, we did that spring, summer, fall, uh, each of the years. And then uh, for aeration, uh, we actually uh, went uh, really crazy and we aerated every month for seven months, uh, April to October. And we also aerated uh, the entire park areas uh, twice in the years. So the middle area of Roosevelt that I talked about is kind of our uh, high use area. And then Garden Acres, uh, all the athletic areas are, are where we aerated uh, seven times that year or the past years. And then another key component is we bought a uh, seed to over see these areas and uh, you know after heavy use uh, we incorporate all that uh, in uh, with our aerations so people always ask well you know what is the difference bottom line of the fertilizers from conventional or synthetic over to organic and so uh, we have four parks that that parks actually uh, does the purchasing and then are we hire out the application of that fertilizer? Um, all the rest are done with the contracts for uh, maintenance. But I wanted to do an apples to apples uh, comparison here. So these are ones that we purchase the fertilizer in house, then we hire a company to help us come out and apply those uh, fertilizers. So these are both granular. Uh, the you know, ones that are synthetic are a 180 day slow release uh, once a year only. And so that's why you see the triple amount for the organic areas. We had to apply those three times a year. It's also why you see that it's 1200 pounds an acre as opposed to uh, 200 per acre, just a much uh, lower nitrogen uh, in that, that fertilizer. And so really it's about two and a half times the acre cost uh, when we were going organic uh, versus synthetic. And that's with applications and everything. Uh, you'll notice that two or so pounds of nitrogen for the whole year is not nearly enough. I usually double that at least. Uh, we just haven't had the budget uh, here in Longmont to to really ramp that up. And so, like most of us, uh, this is a perfect example of you know real world. Uh, you have to work with what you got. So we had to go a little bit uh, lighter rates uh, each of those applications and then. Of course, we we mulch in all of our cuttings to help add back in you know, roughly a pound of nitrogen a year also. So people then always ask me you know, as well, as, okay, it's two and a half times the cost. You know, how can you actually do that then? And so, you know, with the added aeration fertilizer seeding, that does add up. 
And so what I've found is you can actually shift your labor or materials if you're broadleaf spraying or are using uh, pre versions on your turf, you can you know, offset those costs over this, you know, some other uh, fertilizer applications. Uh, if you hire all of it out, it costs a lot of money. Uh, if you have the equipment and can do it in-house, it's obviously a lot cheaper. Uh, what we've found is over the years, you know, year th uh, three now is we actually put uh, less and less inputs in. So we've aerated, uh, aerated far less. Uh, we haven't seen it as much, and uh, the quality of our, our parts have not gone down after backing off some of those things. And so the lastly, uh, you know, as I get a more time here this next year and, and years on, I'm gonna start uh, looking at other fertilizer options. Uh, we have fertigation tanks at all these parks, and we just haven't gone down that road yet of, of trying to use liquid, uh, which is, you know, actually a lot cheaper than uh, having a, a giant truck out there driving all over the park, putting all the material out. So what I want to really bring home is this slide here is that it's really, it's not about the turf health, it's, it's more about soil health. It's, when you focus on the health of that soil, it actually allows your grass to be able to handle those stresses, drought, push out weeds, you know, grow nice and thick. Uh, what's really nice about it is you don't have that huge flush of growth in the springtime, and then you're you're breaking your one third rule of trying to mow it uh, once a week. And you know, if you're lucky, you know, a lot of us have a lot to do in the springtime, and trying to mow uh, you know twice in one week is not possible usually. So this organic program it really helps uh, ease the health of that our, the, our grass in and not jump out of the spring with a huge amount of growth. Now you're trying to keep up with that. Um, so big thing is, is spend all your effort and time on aeration. Our aeration is a huge piece of this, especially where we live. Uh, you add water and you add foot traffic and you get compaction and then you end up with weeds, uh, weak turf, and then uh, spirals down from there. So aeration, uh, overseeding, and the right fertilizer go a long way in this program. And then of course when you're using uh, seed, uh, I've found that if you use a really high quality seed from the various companies all over Colorado here, it makes a huge difference than just your uh, Lowe's or Home Depot uh, seed mixes up from those guys. So quickly, uh, some successes and challenges that we've had. Uh, over at uh, Roosevelt, uh, we've got this nice rose garden on the, on the west end. It's a very narrow uh, walkways between them all. So of course, everyone walks down those pathways. And so we we have a lot of compaction in there and you can I notice there's a pentane down at the bottom here uh, from compaction. And we've got uh, clover out here in the middle, which is a sign of our low nitrogen. And so what we've found is these smaller areas are much harder to manage than big open areas. It takes a lot uh, smaller equipment, more intricate type of work, a lot more uh, involved in this, in these uh, small areas. And this park has a lot of these little areas. So this, uh, these areas take a lot to um, keep up and looking nice. Compared to Garden Acres, uh, which is our big uh, wide open park with um, 
big open athletic areas. Uh, this was taken in August of just this year. Uh, no extra watering. As a matter of fact, all these parks have, have taken less water. We had uh, a uh, uh, consultant actually come in and, and run all of our numbers. And we've actually used less water at both these parks over the last year, couple of years. But there are weeds. If you if you say that a clover is a weed, um, and we do have this out here. Uh, again, it's part of the nitrogen that that we need to add out here. But uh, we have the typical compacted areas you know, where the batters walk out and trample those areas you know, over and over again. So we have to step on those, uh, keep those aerated. But uh, overall, uh, this is what they look like in the middle of August. Your typical field, uh, you know, like any other ones out here. And they're all organically managed with no broadleaf spring, and uh, I think they look uh, pretty nice. So that is all I've got. I want to thank everybody. Uh, here's my email. Uh, if you need that, uh, feel free to reach out, and I will be glad to answer anything. Thank you, Ben. Uh, excellent presentation. Really appreciate that. And as Ben said, I, I'm sure you're going to have questions for him. So that, that Q&A box is open. Please continue to add your questions there. Thank and you. this would be a good time to mention that we are talking about doing a field visit in the spring uh, to see the Longmont Parks and so we will be sending out a follow-up message uh, to um, ask about your interest in taking a visit to Longmont. Uh, now, next up, we have Chip Osborne from Osborne Organics. And I know some of you have met Chip because he's been out here in Colorado, of course, uh, at the uh, city of Longmont, working with the team there, but also visiting with some other park folks in Colorado. So you may have already met Chip. And he is going to provide us with the technical overview of how this is all done. So take it away, Chip. Thanks. Thanks very much, Joyce. So my focus is going to be the technical aspect. Um, before I begin, you know, I want to celebrate Ben and his success and what you just heard from him. Jay and I have worked with park folks and practitioners around the country, and I think Ben is probably the shining example of absorbing all of this, putting it into play, into implementation, and then very effectively being able to communicate what he did and show his successes. And as you saw, the picture on the left here is uh, Roosevelt before we started. The one on the right is a field I've been working on in his 20 years organic. But Ben's pictures this summer aren't that much different. So he, he, he's there, he, he's getting there, and he's probably not too far from being able to reduce applied inputs and therefore bring costs down in, in, in parity. So again, my hat's off to Ben. Just quickly about me, I've been a professional horticulturist for 50 years, 25 years as a licensed chemical applicator, and the most recent 25 years as an organic turf practitioner and consultant. I'm a retired 20-year chairman of my town's Recreation and Park Commission, so very familiar with navigating the public sector, and I work nationally as an organic educator, consultant, and lecturer. So you see these four words up here. And the only one that's in bold is organic, because that is the only word that has a definition. The others have no definitions. They're words that people talk about to describe something along this line. But when Jay and I work on projects, we hold strictly to the definition of organic. We have developed a systems-based approach versus a product approach, and we call it systems-based approach to natural turf management, which is a marriage of three concepts, proper horticultural practices, strong focus on the soil biomass, 
and the use of organic compatible products. Looking at each of these three individual areas and then bringing them together in a well thought out plan. Is it more difficult? The bottom line is probably not, but we need to learn how to do it. Just like Ben coming from the conventional background, he took the time to learn and understand what it takes to make this work. When most of us began our conventional turf and landscape management, we had some kind of training. I was trained conventionally. The same holds true for organic land care. Training and education in new practices and protocols is critically important. So how do we do it? How do we do it with turf? That's our focus today, but it will work on any aspect of the landscape. It is a systems-based approach, heavily focused on soil, particularly the living portion of the soil. We are integrating cultural practices with soil understanding so that we can be successful in creating an environment for the turf grass to grow successfully. We remove salt-based fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers are largely salt-based. Salt is not conducive to growing a healthy biomass and it's not conducive to being environmentally friendly. And with a natural approach, an organic approach, we experience cost savings over time. It may be more expensive in the first two or three years, but costs decline, water use declines, and things come back into perspective. It is not a product swap because we're not focused only on product. And when somebody approaches organic management and tries to swap out product for product, it will fail every time. It's not la more labor intensive and it's not more difficult. That's assuming it, that it's not more time consuming if we're transitioning from a balanced turf program. But I can tell you that many municipalities and school districts that we work with are not doing very much. They may not be aerating. They may not be aerating except once every three years. They don't oversee. They're putting down pre-emergent and selective post-emergent herbicides one or two applications of synthetic fertilizer and calling it a day. That is not a balanced turf program. So when we come to an organic program and we, we talk about the aeration, and one of the biggest reasons of Ben's success is because he's dedicated time to being able to aerate. So when we look at the time and the difficulty, we understand that we're learning a new process and we're moving our time from conventional management into the organic side. We don't expect things to get worse before they get better. 20 years ago, that was the case. And that's what people said because they were approaching it as a swapping of product. If we do this properly with a strong focus, both below and above the ground, success follows over the period known as transition. When a natural management program is being put in place after chemical intensive conventional management, we have this window of time that we call the transition period. This is the time that's required to make practice and input changes, to get and learn the education and understand what we're doing. This is when we work on pilot projects and work on relatively small areas and then expand to larger areas, which is exactly what Ben did. So for a municipal field and, and, and parks, we're typically looking at a transition period of three years. For a residential lawn, it might be half of that. A lot of it depends on what the soil is, is it, what the place the soil is in on day one. We set realistic expectations. You see two expectations here. This is a double A professional baseball field that I worked on and was organic for two years. Uh, and on the right is a municipal playing field, and that's the one that's the 20-year organic model. Expectations may be low, medium, or high. Cultural intensity is what we call all of the resources that go into managing product, labor, water, whatever is required to meet different levels of expectations. Expectations, low expectations, not always bad. High expectations, not always good the appropriate expectation for the site. Low level of expectations, relatively low input and relatively low cost. Higher level of expectations, higher levels of input and a higher cost. 
talking about weeds and turf, we talked about it should not get worse before it gets better. So in that top middle picture, that is pretty much a monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass with an occasional blemish here and there. If we take a property like that and convert it or move it over to an organic program, we don't expect weeds to come flying in and taking over the system as long as we begin with a focus below ground. Bottom left is a picture of extremely high expectations and on top left is a lower expectation. The reality on the top left with that lower expectation, and it was turf grass at one point, but it's now become a diverse group of plant material. To try to say that in a three year transition, we can turn that into the bottom picture probably is not a realistic expectation. The bottom bottom middle picture is a, is a, is a uh, property in Chicago Pre and post emergent herbicides were used there prior to us beginning pilot program out there. And you can see they weren't that successful. So we're overcoming, you know, that. The picture on the right, Northern California. The idea that in a three year transition, we can make that better is very doable. Can we turn that into the turf grass in the, in the top middle picture? Probably not. So that's where I say expectations have to be realistic. Conventional versus natural management. Conventional management is all of these things. Synthetic fertilizers, chemical pesticides, quick fix, product approach, prophylactic use, meaning just in case, treating symptoms. Crabgrass is a symptom. It's not a problem. Conventional products treat that symptom preventative applications. And we're also looking at this conventional view of soil, chemistry, texture, and biology as being unrelated to each other. But in natural organic management, we have natural organic product exclusively with no synthetics. Soil testing is the basis for all of our inputs. We choose product based on long-term benefit, not immediate gratification. We don't treat symptoms, we solve problems. So if we're looking at crabgrass as being a symptom, we know that it can be created by the grass being cut too short. It can be very compacted. The pH could be out of whack. The soil could be struggling. Simply not enough grass plants growing in a square foot. If we systematically solve each one of those problems, crabgrass will go away without herbicide. Healthy soil is at the base of it all, and we're now following this emerging view of soil health, where we understand that chemistry, texture, and biology are all interrelated. And that point in the middle that I refer to as soil health is largely driven by the humus fraction of organic matter as an energy source and the soil microbial life itself. Soil basics are important to healthy turf. Soil basics are things that we tend to overlook in our management programs. I just want to focus on the first two here. Soil structure and pore space. Soil structure, by definition, is simply the arrangement of all the particles in the soil. Pore space is the concept that says all soil particles from the microscopic sheets of clay to the larger grains of sand should be surrounded on all sides by pockets of air that contain oxygen. When we get a compacted field, when things get to struggle, that's because we're losing soil structure. We're watering all the time. The soil won't hold moisture. The oxygen and pore space is eliminated and the turf grass struggles. Soil testing is our jumping off point. We test for soil chemistry, soil textural analysis. We put soils under a microscope and we look at total levels of biological organisms and what they're doing there. And then we look at what part of it is active and actually working for us. And we understand what we may need to do to adjust that. Soil health is a new concept and new testing that integrates the results of chemistry and biology. And it allows us to understand how much carbon we're sequestering through our practices. It allows us to understand how chemistry and biology are working together to give us the desired results. Soil biological life is critically important. We need oxygen in the soil. And when we have that, when, we ha when we're well aerated, 
we have healthy biological life, all of these statements are true. Nutrients are held, water is retained, microbiology creates and maintains soil structure, disease does not have a functional place to grow, the eggs of many insect pests become a food source for biological life, and most importantly, nutrients are cycled at the correct rate the plant needs. Bacteria break down that organic fertilizer and higher level predators known as protozoic consume that bacteria and the end result is the release of ammonium nitrogen. This is just showing the difference between the two kinds of fertilizer. On the left, the conventional is water soluble, quick in, quick out. We talk about it directly feeding the plant. Ben referenced the bursts of growth. On the right, organic fertilizer, nutrients come plant, animal, and mineral based. It is water insoluble nitrogen. It needs that bacteria that I just referenced, and it needs the protozoa to eat the bacteria to get the release. So microbial breakdown, critically important. And now we're talking about feeding the soil and not feeding the plant. And we're getting long-term benefit and measured growth. Production consumes fossil fuels. It takes five ton of petrochemical equivalent between natural gas and petroleum to produce one ton of 4600 urea. When we're talking about a carbon footprint, that says it all up front. Releases greenhouse gases, disturbs the soil ecosystem, high salt, upsets soil balance, and has the ability to leach. This is at the heart of all turf grass nutrition. On the right, you see these products. They all say food in some way, shape, or form. Food on these labels is strictly advertising. It's not founded in science. Photosynthesis is the process where plant food is made. So we have to understand in the beginning that there's nothing in a fertilizer bag that is food for the plant. They're raw materials. Photosynthesis is simply that process where we have green chlorophyll in the blade of grass, energy from the sun in the presence of carbon dioxide and moisture. On the grass plant, on the blade of grass, there are microscopic openings and CO2 goes right in and has a chemical reaction with chlorophyll. Carbohydrate, amino acid, and sugars are produced, and that is plant food. The plant is making its own food. Up to 80% of the carbohydrates produced in this process find their way into the root system and half of them find their way into the soil <clears throat> as sequestered carbon and nourishing the biomass. Cultural, and pra cultural practices are arguably the most important aspect of an overall management plan. These are the cultural practices, not enough time to go into them all in detail, but they are absolutely on equal footing with fertilizers. <clears throat> Compaction is the biggest enemy of turf grass. It degrades soil structure, heavy use, traffic, air particles are squeezed out, aeration reverses that. In that top picture, that turf loss is strictly from compaction. Because if we put a penetrometer on there, we'd be at 300 PSI and grass simply can't grow at that density of soil. So we have to reverse that. There's no amount of fertilizer, water, grass seed, anything that we could do to that that's going to make any positive benefit until we reverse compaction. For school districts and municipalities, how do we start? First thing is not to have a fear of failure. Ben was great because we, we did not have a fear of failure. Ben jumped right in from the beginning and moved forward. Be willing to try a different approach, reorient your education and understanding of the landscape, and then embrace these five key points. Soil testing, determining expectations, understanding the landscape, organic input only, and strong horticultural practices. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. I know you compressed a lot of information into a short amount of time. And of course, this is just meant to get everybody oriented to this program. Um, it's not a full technical training, of course, and we certainly welcome something like that in the future um, from this group. 
And now I'm really pleased to have David Bell with us today. He is going to talk about the overall citywide approach. He's Longmont's Natural Resources Manager of Public Works and Natural Resources. Thanks for coming, Ben, David. Great, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for having the opportunity to address this group because um, I, I think it will help those who are coming in cautiously optimistic realize that this is not something that you know we stepped in too lightly. And um, I will share that this has been an ongoing goal for me personally and professionally over the years is reducing the synthetic, synthetic um, pesticides and fertilizers that are in our systems here in the city, but also in former um, jobs as well. And I did not even have a chance to stage my office, but um, with Jay's introduction, probably the one book you see over my shoulder right there that I've lugged her on since the mid eighties is Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. So this really has been something that has been important to me personally and professionally. Um, however, with that said, managing the public's resources, if that's the turf they're playing on or their, um, their dollars coming as tax dollars, how we manage that responsibly. I am extremely cautious and pragmatic in the, in the use of those dollars. So uh, probably no one knows that more than Alan Lewis. And he's mentioned this is a ongoing relationship and we've been working together for well over a decade trying to make this work. So how did this really come about and how did it work and why was this successful for Longmont? Um, it really came about because of the team that was brought together. And that really starts first and foremost with Ben and his desire personally and professionally to make this happen. Um, the next was a team that came along as we, we started working um, with Chip and his technical resources beyond pesticides for the resources they brought to the table to help us make this cautious step forward that we could start working on this. And then people and pollinators and that community involvement and finally, natural grocers and Allen that really have helped support this in the community as well. So it really has taken that whole group to move this, this forward. And again, for me and that, that role of having to be able to respond to councils and the public on what we're doing with their resources, this program has allowed us to take a step into this without jeopardizing our whole system. They've been able to work with us on how we manage risk, how we manage our resources, and what happens if things potentially go sideways. And we really haven't seen that because I think most of the people in this in this uh, webinar right now recognize that having healthy turf is fundamental to be able to outcompete weeds. And as we looked at those pictures, you know, we we still have a ways to go in this. We haven't figured out the bare ground. We haven't figured out our shrub beds, but putting in place those pieces that um, Chip talk, talked about um, and that Ben has been implementing with the aeration, the overseeding, um, the organic fertilizers, we have been able to create healthy um, turf that outcompetes weeds. And that really does a couple of things. It gives us then time to start focusing on those other more challenging areas and have those conversations. But I think for me personally, as we look at what the community is asking for, it really is going to be this move towards less synthetic inputs and more organic practices. And if we as professionals start, start taking that move because we based it on these, these good sort of inputs and resources, we're gonna to be told to make those changes and nothing's gonna be worse than if you have a program that hasn't really thought about this and have council direction or some other direction says that you've gotta make this change next year and you don't have a plan, that's the worst spot you can be in. Um, one of the things that I've recognized for a long time, if you don't have a plan, it's organic by neglect. And that, uh, again, is going to be something that's really going to be a challenge for us to recover from. So I just want to say thank you for um, those of you who showed up to kind of look at what Longmont has done, but then go back to all those who have supported us in this process. And I look forward to as we make this transition going forward, um, the continued support and our willingness and ability to share what we've learned with um, others out there. So that's all I had today. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your uh, leadership in this area. It's been a pleasure to work with you and your team. So thank you. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have a good amount of time for questions and they are rolling in. So uh, I'm going to invite our panelists to turn on cameras uh, and be prepared for some questions. And I'll, I'll get the first one going. I've heard that healthier soil and plants sequester more carbon. 
Uh, this person is wondering how that benefit has been figured into, or has it been figured into the cost equation? How does organic land management play a role in climate change action plans? And I think um, there was a little bit of this addressed in Chip's presentation, but I'll open this up to whoever uh, feels they want to tackle it. Uh, I, I could just make make the comment that uh, when a plant is grown with heavy pressure from synthetics, whether it's synthetic fertilizer or pesticides, herbicides, that's stressful for the plant. So the, the grass plant is not as vibrant, not as healthy. We're bypassing natural processes. So that in and of itself weakens the plant, even though it doesn't appear to visually. So as we remove the salt-based fertilizers and we remove pesticides, what happens is we're beginning to grow a healthier plant. It's able to better photosynthesize. And then, as I mentioned, those carbohydrate exudates are what you know goes down 40% of those carbohydrate exudates, leave the root system and feed mycorrhizal fungi and feed beneficial organisms and actually bring them to the root of the grass plant. So we are sequestering carbon and that same sequestered carbon is now energy to produce a more vibrant biomass. That combined with the fact that we're reducing and eliminating all of the petroleum based products is where we I think are big steps towards, you know, addressing the issue. Thanks, Chip. Here's a question about artificial turf. Somebody has a field that's in terrible shape and they're considering artificial turf because they're told it saves water and has less maintenance costs. Somebody want to take that one? I mean, I can address that as someone who has had to manage synthetic turf uh, from my park department. It is not without maintenance. Uh, there's a significant amount of maintenance. It has to be disinfected, and the disinfecting products are pesticides. Uh, they're, they're, you know, the um, the whole idea that you put synthetic turf in and it lasts for ten years, and you don't have to do anything to it is is not true. If you're in a hot summer, a lot of fields have irrigation from the perimeter going into the center because it can be 40, 50 degrees warmer. So there's a lot of issues and I urge everybody to be cautious and look at those hidden costs and, and, and what you you don't what people what the, what the salesmen or consultants for the industry don't tell you is in a 20 year cost. You have to put it out to 20 years because if, if the field lasts for 10 years and 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 manufacturers are now saying, believe it or not, that synthetic turf needs to be rested. If you pound it 365 days a year, you're going to lose its resiliency. You have to take use off of it and let it spring back again. But in 10 years, you peel it off, dispose of it, and put down a new surface. At the 20-year point, you have to dig the whole thing up and start all over again because manufacturers don't warranty two, two, you know, three surfaces on one base. So as municipalities look at it, just make sure you ask the hard questions and if you take your cue from professional football, 75% of the athletes think it shortens their career. And professional soccer players in Europe, you can't play uh, the World Cup on anything but natural grass. And a lot have in their contract, they won't play on synthetic turf. So municipalities may think it's an easy way out, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. And you do take on another host of toxic related issues. Um, some of these have the PFAS or the forever chemical in them as well. So um, not not a safe alternative by any means. Can I, can, just to add, oh, David, you're gonna- No, go ahead, go ahead, Jay. Well, I was just gonna say that, you know, there are issues around disinfectant and depending on the manufacturer, I mean, the typical recommendation is that fields are sprayed down with disinfectant material or antimicrobials after each play. Um, and that, you know, that's an exposure to chemicals that for where we're seeing in the medical arena resistance, right? Antibiotics and the cross resistance associated with antimicrobials means that when you really need a disinfectant in a medical scenario, 
that the efficacy of those antibiotics go go down considerably. In fact, um, you know, the United Nations has identified uh, down the road, if unless we get this under control, we're going to see a pandemic associated with, and we know what that's all about, right? Associated with um, resistance to antibiotics. Um, that's one thing. The other, the other thing that I think we're seeing when Chip and I travel the country, we're seeing a real connection here in this program, this organic land management with climate action and the work that's typically going on in a community around climate action. And when we talk about climate action, we're talking about two sides of a coin, right? We're talking about the drawdown of atmospheric carbon and sequestration, but we're also talking about what do we purchase as a municipality? Are we purchasing materials that contribute to the climate problem, meaning pet petroleum-based chemicals? Are we using fertilizers? And we don't talk much about this. We should talk more about these synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen that creates ni nitrous oxide, because that's a greenhouse gas about 200 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So, you know, the whole question of a system and what goes into that system and what gets eliminated in an organic system really is a is a climate action discussion on so many levels. Um, similarly with synthetic, you know, these are plastic fields and microplastics and covering up nature and eliminating that opportunity of open space areas to interact with nature and sequester carbon, I think is, you know, increasingly, we'll, I think we'll recognize that as problematic. Ben, are you using reclaimed water and uh, for irrigation? And also, do you have any estimate of money that's been saved in water cost or reductions in general? And I guess this is for David and Ben. I'll let Ben take that one. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Garden Acres is uh, raw water. Uh, the reason out of ditches uh, ranked through Longmont. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have uh, just amazing uh, water rights from decades previous. So our water cost is is almost nothing. I mean, there's cost there, um, but it's not like other um, places along the uh, front range here. But uh, so our whole focus you know, wasn't on just water savings, you know, which a lot of people have, but it is a piece that that comes into that. Um, so dollar amounts saved that we haven't ever really calculated it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we haven't, I know the one park we've used, you know, well over 2 million gallons of water on just the one park alone, and there's, what, 40, some of them in Longmont? So if you add all that up, you the savings is tremendous, but I know dollar amount on that. Okay, thank you. Here's a question. If we go organic, what organic pesticide can I use to replace glyphosate? Uh, this person's thinking about fence lines and hardscapes. And so Chip, I think this really speaks to your comment about replacing one thing for another, and we have to be thinking about a whole systems approach, but can you tackle that, Chip, please? Uh, yeah, sure. The um, That is the one area where we will be putting aside one product and making a, a decision to choose, you know, something else. There are a number of alternative products now out on the market, 10 or 12, uh, you know, as, as non-selective herbicides. None of them translocate into the root system yet fully effectively and kill the plant from the top down. Uh, so it, you know, it, it may be, you know, it may need a second application. But, you know, one of the things that Jay and I feel strongly of and I think should be part of all fence line field designs in the future is rubber matting under the fence line. And we did this in Hawaii. We worked on a project on Kauai. And that would, you know, because when you spray down a fence line and you get the dead brown grass, the dead brown grass stays there for a month. 
it's not attractive, right? It 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 so it it's like but taking the time to invest one time in rubber mats that go under the fence line and extend three or four inches out each side, and then the mower comes right up to it. That's the long term solution, and it doesn't become product organic or otherwise. Okay, this leads right into the question, which I've heard many times: uh, the organic herbicide labels sometimes have a higher signal word on the label. Um, so really, is it safer for the environment and human health? Well, that is, you, you know, that that applies to the non-selective herbicides. So the, the, the short answer to that is that synthetic herbicides are those that are associated with long-term human health issues. So that's what we've just experienced the last several years with glyphosate as an active ingredient or the inert ingredients that Jay talked about. Because the organic alternatives are organic acids, pelagonic acid, acetic acid, citric acid, then they can, it, it, you have to take precaution. Just because it's organic doesn't mean you throw caution to the wind. You have to be just as careful. So if you get, you know, 20% acetic acid, which is four times, five times the strength of household vinegar in your eyes, you know, you have an issue. If you breathe it, you know, you have an issue. So, but the, the the quick answer on that also is that those materials are not associated with long-term human health effects. So synthetics have the long-term impact. Organic is to the applicator. There's no residual issue on the grass or, or the, the hardscape. It's just strictly applicator. And any trained applicator needs to know that because it's organic, you have to take every bit as much care. So oh, Joyce, mm -hmm. if I, I could jump in there too, I think Absolutely. the thing that I really appreciate with this program, I'd like to talk to those people that are trying to think of all the scenarios that might not work. The thing that's been great with this is that you do not think you're exactly where you're at. If you take on at least a portion of this and you work on your your part turf, turf health, you're taking 80% of your system out of those synthetics right away. And then you can work with Chip and the others on what are those other things that start replacing the glyphosates and stuff too. It's going to be a much smaller percentage. So for me, it's, it's taking those steps forward where we can take the easy low-hanging fruit, which is that that big turf areas um, and start pulling the synthetics off of those and then start really having those deeper conversations of what do we do with the fence lines? What do you do with the shrub beds? Um, and, and those are going to be probably ongoing conversations, but we can be making progress um, on our turf fields in the meantime. Yeah, I'll often say that we recommend starting with turf because it's one of the simplest area, areas to eliminate pesticide use. So it's a good place to start. So just to kind of back up what David's saying, and then you start working on the other issues that might be a little bit more sticky. Joyce, um, we were on a site, Chip and I were on a site recently where we asked about the fence line management and we always sort of put mechanical management or mechanical controls down at the bottom of the list. But we asked, you know, what do you guys do? Because they're not using any pesticides on this field. And, oh, I take the string trimmer and I walk along the fence line. Oh, is that problematic? For no, I enjoy it. <laughs> so, I don't know. I would get, they're going to be different opinions on that. But in some cases, the, you know, there is a mechanical response or a program that can be adopted. Very nice. When weeds get established, how do you manage broadleaf weeds, especially invasive ones? Um, you know, when it, 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 it depends on what the weed is, whether it's an annual grassy weed, whether it's a simple perennial weed, or whether it's a compound perennial weed. So three different kinds of weeds all have different strategies involved in their management. Simple perennials like broadleaf plantain uh, and dandelions can be easily controlled with aeration, overseeding, and turf creating turf density. Uh, I one of my first projects ever back in 2001 was a football field that was 35, 40% covered in broadleaf plantain because nothing had been done for years. It took a year and a half aeration, everything that Ben does now. And we we did that and we did, and it wasn't even aggressive and it wasn't expensive. And at the end, there's I have a picture, there was no broadleaf plantain left. 
because we simply changed that system to better support the grass and discourage the weed. Now, when you get into other types of weeds, e each class of weed, and there's too many out there to go into, you know, at this point, but we learned to manage. It was an annual grassy weed. It's managed with turf density and investing in grass seed. So instead of investing in pre-emergent and then accepting that liability, you're going to put just like Ben did. And he didn't go out and buy the cheapest seed on the shelf. He bought the real deal. And that makes the difference. And, and that really is the, the way that we approach weeds. It's sort of, you learn to think outside the box and then say, what can I do to solve the problem? I just like jumping again, just again, just to be transparent with our program too. And if you look at what Ben's done, that's worked great. He actually brought those problem areas where we start seeing places where we have compaction, we have other um, needs and we've a couple of things. We have to help our community understand that clover is not something we're going to care a whole lot about. Um, but with this group here, I think you all are probably going to recognize what do you do with the the bindweed and the in the Canada thistle? We got some out there that we haven't quite figured out yet, and we have not removed that whole toolbox from our staff. But where we have these problem areas, we'll deal with those. But again, we have such a big area that we can manage with CHIPS program that we can then focus on those small areas in a very open, transparent way that we haven't figured out yet and talk to our councils and stuff. But um, I, I think that's where we're at. We, again, haven't removed all Ben's tools, but we have taken these large turf areas and said, this, this is pretty easy to do. We, we're going to continue that every place we can. Jay, do you want to jump in on that at all? I know it's probably not the, you know, the ideal answer, but I want to make sure this group understands what Longmont's doing. Yeah. I think what you're pointing out, which is really important to the, pro to the program, is that you know, we're not just writing a report. Chip's not just writing a plan and then giving it to you and saying, see you later. You know, we are trying to recognize that these this is a problem solving opportunity and having the opportunity to consult with Chip, which is totally underwritten under the program. That's an important component here as things come up and as challenges, um, you know, emerge here. Um, we were on a site last fall and we needed to get, we want to do overseeding and we needed to get germination establishment before the winter weather set in, but we had all these surface weeds on, on the site. And, you know, if you read the page, it goes aerate and seed. But we realized in brainstorming that if we took a York rake and remove those weeds off the surface, we'd get more soil to seed, seed to soil contact. And you should see the field now. We got that jump on the weed population, got the got the concentration of, you know, we of of grasses in there that is able to sh to push out the weed population. So, you know, I'm not saying that that example applies everywhere, certainly but it's an example of where brainstorming can be very helpful to move the program along quickly. Ben, can you talk about your balance of in-house work versus contractors? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, most of our products are actually hired out for mowing operations, uh, fertilizing all of that. Um, the ones that are we, chose to do uh, in-house or to have this program are done in-house and that's why we chose those partners that, that we would have you know handling all of that uh, operations so for the actual products themselves uh, we hired out the uh, application of all the fertilizer there's a local company here that actually we buy a thousand pound totes of fertilizer, tons of them. And then uh, he comes in, he has a specialized little uh, crane, uh, loads it into his truck and then drives the whole park, throwing that fertilizer you know, 80 feet uh, as he uh, drives around. So we uh, hire out only the application of fertilizer, all the rest of the aeration, overseeding, all that is done in-house. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Uh, the next question relates to really, um, th this is from somebody in HOA wanting to convert um, turf 
to organic management, but certainly I, I think there's a lack of training in this area in terms of who has this expertise and um, really just to ask your HOA to go organic can be difficult if your contractor doesn't have that training. I will just comment here that I think that's why having more experts in Colorado who have done pilots and we can have more of this peer-to-peer -peer sort of um, working together to spread the word on it because we know having a really in-depth uh, pilot program everywhere is impossible, but certainly we'd like to do more of these. Uh, but if any, if you have any advice, um, anybody here on the panel about how to make that conversion when there aren't a lot of trained landscapers. Well, I've, I've worked for a number of years in the front range and, and a lot with Joyce, as she mentioned, and with Rella Abernathy and Boulder and we've worked with HOAs and worked with landscape contractors. And what it's going to take is consumer demand. When enough consumers demand of their practitioners that they want a different approach, it's going to force that practitioner to go out and learn how to do it correctly. And that's what we, you know, pre-COVID, we were doing that. I was in Boulder three or four times, you know, working on that. But that's the approach from an HOA is that if, if you don't want to learn how to do it, and if you don't want to learn how to do it correctly, you're going to try to find someone else that does. And then the other part of it is trying to ramp up the education. And as Joyce said, you know, building critical mass with people like Ben out there to be able to impart information is going to go a long way. Thanks. Here's a real uh, practical one. And I know this was something that you, you may have struggled with a bit, um, really finding the organic fertilizers to replace the synthetic ones. Are you receiving chicken manure from factory farms? Any thoughts on where to source high quality manure? Uh, yes, yeah. so it's actually uh, pretty relevant to this year. Uh, we actually had to do turkey waste um, because, uh, as, as many of us know, the, uh, we had the avian flu issue at the end of last year. And so the company here in Colorado that uh, we were using, I had to dispose of all their uh, stockpiled fertilizer. So, yeah, we had a hard time, you know, getting a hold of 31,000 pounds of it. And so we had to get creative. I worked with Chip and we... Got, uh, you know, I work with a, a local a fertilizer company and, you know, send over options and try to make a, you know, combination thing out of, you know, what was here locally. And um, so each year is different. Each year there's challenges. That's why, you know, try to work with Chip each, each uh, start of the year and try to get a hold of, you know, what fertilizer we're going to use and for the year and uh, it's not always easy especially if we start adding you know more and more acreage that's going to take a lot for the fertilizer oh great and just uh while you're at it ben uh chip referenced expectations for different parks so somebody uh, would like to know really what what were the expectations for your parks high, medium, low, and um, yeah, and any issue with soil types in Longmont as well uh, in those yeah. parts. Uh, expectations, you know, everyone expects your park to look nice. You know, we, Dave and I talked about this a lot. Everybody has a different you know, expectation level or, you know, a grade level of what the park looks like uh, overall. So if I look at it and I think it's a B, but my neighbor thinks it's an A, uh, you know, it looks you know, nice to them. Uh, you know, that's, what, that's mostly, you know, what uh, we're after is, you know, usable, uh, nice parks. Uh, the athletic field, obviously, you know, has a higher expectation that actually, you know, to function safely uh, for athletics. And not have you know a ton of weeds in them, and uh, you know actually have 
players keep in mind out there. Um, but it, it was really funny. We didn't really tell you know, a lot of people we were actually doing this program. We wanted to see if anyone actually even noticed that we went from old to new and, and nobody did. It, it, it looks the same as when we started uh, four years ago. And so that's the that's the major takeaway of it is it you know it looks the same overall, um, actually even you know better in areas because of extra uh, aerations and all that. Depth tutorials here. Uh, we water you know three or four times a week, depending on the year, and then people are on those fields or on those parks. You know, and you can you I can patch on that. Soil, you're adding water and then people on it. So that's where you got to up the aeration and keep on those cultural practices. Otherwise, you can toss as much fertilizer and seed, you add it as you want and uh, uh, won't help you out. Nice. Well, we have about four minutes left and still a lot of questions. Uh, any particular kinds of fields that would like um, that we would like to see as part of this parks for a sustainable future enter as a pilot? I mean, I, I think I can say on the outset that um, if a municipality would like to do a pilot park, we encourage it to be an, an important park to you, um, a park that's really a standout one for your community that you care about, because we really want to emphasize this as an important project and not just some small uh, park that no one sees because we want it to be an educational tool. But if anybody else has any other thoughts on that, please uh, weigh in. Oh, yeah, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll just mention that, you know, like Chip had said earlier, if you start with a baseline park that's already nice, that's already you know, at your B level or higher, you start you know, working on that park, it's much, much easier than if you say, hey, this park over here, you know, nobody wants to use it anymore. It's all dirt and there's all weeds. You know, it's much, much harder. And then, you know, people won't you know, have interest in it. They don't fund it you know, as easily. And then it's just a, it, it's a much worse time to demonstrate you know, how you can actually do that program. That that's exactly right. I mean, Jay and I get handed parts that actually need a stick of dynamite, and heaven forbid that we ruin a good one. And we get dealt some cards that this, it's short of a huge, tremendous budget or a redo in two or three years. There's not a whole lot, just like Ben told you, that's going to make a positive chain. So I guess just not to be afraid that if you pick you know, a, a B property or better, that you're not going to lose it, that it's not going to deteriorate and go down to a C or a D. And you can see from Ben's work and, and all the other models that we have that just, it doesn't happen that way. It does not deteriorate. And I, this is a really important point because, you know, we find when we do soil tests, for instance, right on a, on a site, that there are a range of soils, levels of organic matter, microbial activity, active bacteria, active fungi, all the things we're looking for. And we, we've learned, of course, that when municipalities hire firms to come in and construct their fields, there's not enough energy thought uh, put into the soil that's going into that field. And as a result, when CHIP shows up, you look at the soil and you go, you know, you guys, you didn't get a good deal on this, you know, installation because they haven't given you soil that really can perform. Because, you know, they're thinking, well, you're going to use synthetic fertilizers, pre-emergent, post-emergent herbicides. Why do you need good soil? <laughs> um, so with our perspective, we find ourselves talking to municipalities a lot about as they think about renovation of a field. What are the elements that go into that? What are the, the, the specifications that you need to require of that field? Depth of topsoil, you know? 
level of the, because these soils are engineered to bring in the microbial life and the soil food web. And then you're off and running. Once, once you've got that installation, you're in great shape. So we're not saying the field has to be perfect for us to come in, far from it. But there are situations where the fields really require renovation. Well, we are at the half hour, and I want to thank you all for lending your incredible expertise to us today and uh, for everybody attending, for spending an extended lunch hour with us. Um, especially, Ben, thank you for sharing your story. And we will be sending out a follow-up message to all of you that attended and there'll be an opportunity to pro provide feedback. And for those questions we didn't get answered, please, please use that follow-up message to get back in touch with us. And I just want to wish you all a great afternoon and hope to um, see you all again soon. Great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for all your work, guys.